I wonder, as a Christian, how you feel the political space is suffering and how, as a Christian, you navigate that, particularly with the, you know, grant unto Caesar, what is Caesar's sort of partition that many people of faith seem to rely on when it comes to the distinction between the spiritual life and life more generally. It seems to be sort of unraveling, particularly in America, in our culture here today. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Bible teacher and a speaker, and uh, these are the things that I, I look at, but I always look at them through the lens of history, certainly, uh, because history repeats itself, but also biblical history. And, and in biblical history, you have, you have the people of God. We'll, so we'll say that America at one time, 1950s, 1960s, 1940s, whatever era, is a, a Christian country. It's known as a Judeo-Christian country. But being a Judeo-Christian country means that you have, you have a king, or you have Jesus, you have leadership. And when you fall away from those basic principles of what Jesus called us to do on a daily basis, then you have this vacuum, and in comes the neighboring nations, in comes the, the, the opponent's view. And so you have this, you have this uh, pattern in the Bible of exile, in return, exile and return. And so the people of God begin to be disobedient. And what happens? Their enemy comes in, causes amazing confusion. And in some cases, this exile, like the Babylonian exile, where they're there for 70 years, they think about it, and they kind of get their, their act together. They come back and they rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel. Well, I think that right now there is there is this fragmenting in our in our culture, and people are really asking the question, well, who's in charge? Because my parents, my grandparents said, well, we just went to church and we thought God was in charge. But now it seems to be a race for what party's in charge, what philosophy is going to be in charge, and anything goes. And I think the silence from Christians is telling and if they don't say something, I think we will turn into something that we never imagined we'd become. Do you believe that it's possible for any particular nation to make a claim to be the inheritors of the mantle of Christendom in a way that I suppose was implicit in earlier colonial enterprises, certainly the British Empire and embedded in our understanding of the state is a inherent relationship between God, the monarch, and the population. And I wonder, with the increasing number of Christians in a country like China, if America, with its sort of ideas around manifest destiny, can any longer claim to be the natural inheritors of this mantle of Christendom. We spoke a mo for a moment, Jeff, off air about the, the fact that the first four centuries of Christianity are marked by a kind of ex almost explicit anti-establishment stance as Christians then are persecuted by the Roman Empire prior to the conversion of Constantine. I wonder, <laughs> I'm asking quite a big question here, I realise, if you can track the relationship between Christianity and the state for us and, and make clear any obvious contradictions and challenges that will have to be confronted by any nation that attempts to use Christianity as a kind of um, scepter of its own power when it seems to me that it's at odds with the idea of a political nation state. Right. Well, the best example I can give you, Russell, is what actually happened just prior to uh, Jesus coming on the scene 2,000 years ago. You know, the Roman Empire was, well, like today in America, we you know feel like we're the most powerful nation in the earth, and the question is, well, can you fall? Yeah, anybody can fall. They can become a third world country. But before, before Jesus was, was born, there was the Roman Republic. And the Roman Republic was led by what was called the Triumvirate. And so you have Julius Caesar and two others really running the, the Republic. And then uh, Julius Caesar makes the mistake of proclaiming that he's God, which is not something that I would recommend. And when he, when he, he claimed that he was God, of course, he was assassinated, Brutus, you too, Brutus, in the Senate. But before he died, he did something to his will. And what he did to his will was he adopted a young man. And nobody knew this until he died. They open up the will and they think, oh my gosh, he adopted Octavian. 
And Octavian was a member of the second triumvirate, along with Mark Anthony and another. Well, the, there was a lot of tension between Mark Anthony and Octavian, and the battle went out to war, in, went out to sea in the Battle of Actium. And it was there that Octavian defeated Mark Anthony, came back into Rome, and he was ushered in, given the senatorial name of Caesar Augustus. And he's the one that was credited for Pax Romana, the peace. And this is very interesting, is that he released what was called the Euangelion, that is, the good news. So at the time of Jesus' birth, which Paul would say in, in, the, in the fullness of time, right at the right moment, Jesus is born, and he's born into a world that is worshiping Caesar, the God-man, the Prince of Peace, and the one who ushered in the good news. Now, there was a stone that was found in Corinth that actually had that on it, and that it, it said that never before, during, or after will anybody eclipse the glory of Caesar Augustus. He is the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the one who ushered in the good news. That's the atmosphere. And so we have this clash from the very beginning. Well, who is the king? Who is the Prince of Peace? Who has the good news? And of course, that's what I believe as a Christian. I believe that. And it, what was interesting was that Paul, in his missionary journeys, he went out into Asia Minor. He went out into Europe where everybody was worshiping Caesar and they wanted to kill him in Athens. And he, in his language, is telling the whole known world at that time, there is a king, and there is a prince of peace, and there is good news. And they wanted to kill him because of it. Some of them, of course, accepted it. But I think, Russell, what you have here today is a battle for the king. I think that there is a definite battle going on. And who are people going to give allegiance to? But with the dawning of the internet, it could be a guy sitting in his in his apartment in Chicago, you know, or it could be a, somebody over in Austria that is uh, sitting in their backyard YouTubing, you know, or they're on uh, Instagram or Rumble, and they can actually begin to put out there a philosophy that people would grab a hold of, and it can grow. Never before have we seen this type of thing where there are so many philosophies, so many as Jesus would say, a yokes. And when he called his disciples, he said, take my yoke. And that meant my worldview, the way I see the world, the way I see marriage, the way I see children, the way I see social justice, the way I see uh, widows and finance and, and, uh, and so forth. That's what Jesus gives us, is that, that yoke. But what the world is saying is, I have a yoke that you can take as well. So I think we're in a mess, to be honest with you, but a mess that can be dealt with. <laughs> hey, this is exciting. We've got a great partner today. It's Rumble. But beyond Rumble, it's Rumble's latest venture. Let me ask you first, are you a Sleepy Joe type character with zero cognitive performance, struggling to muster focus and brain power for basic things like running the United States of America? You've got to stop drinking woke liberal coffee that hates you and your way of life and start your day by drinking Rumble's very own 1775 coffee. This is going to be the best tasting coffee you've ever had. Seriously good, ethically sourced from a family farm in the high altitude mountains of Bolivia. Not in the Bolivian lowlands run not by a family, but by a single man still living with a pet. No! Instead of waking up and drinking your big corporation owned woke ideology coffee that's probably making you sick from the pesticides it's sprayed with, try it. Rumbles. 1775 revolutionary coffee. Support freedom of speech. Build a parallel economy that actually values you and loves you. My favorite? It's dark, of course. I've always found the lure of the dark irresistible. I'm sorry, how can I stay mad at you? You're just going to have to wait over there for a little while. Level up your morning routine with a 1775 coffee. Sleep all night knowing your hard-earned dollary dues are going towards supporting freedom-loving creators like me on Rumble. Visit 1775coffee.com now. Pick up your first bag. Use the code BRAND to save 10% on your first order. Oh, come on. Why choose, you know? 
Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to, or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.